For all the polarization that grips Washington, here's a source of rare consensus. The emerging threat of China's push to acquire our healthcare data, including the DNA of American citizens. U.S. officials tell us the communist regime's aggressive collection of our most personal information presents a danger both to national security and our economy. As alarm bells ring across agencies, parties, and presidential administrations, different branches of government have taken action over the past year to stem the tide of our medical data flowing to China. The quest to control our biodata and in turn control healthcare's future has become the new space race, with more than national pride in the balance. Our investigation begins with an unsolicited and surprising proposal that came from overseas at the onset of the COVID crisis. Early last March, the state of Washington was the site of the first major coronavirus outbreak in the U.S. As COVID rates and the need for tests were spiking, BGI Group, the world's largest biotech firm, a global giant based in China, approached the state of Washington with an enticing offer. In a strikingly personal letter to the governor, BGI proposed to build and help run state-of-the-art COVID testing labs. BGI would, quote, provide technical expertise, provide high-throughput sequencers, and even make additional donations. It seemed like an offer the state couldn't refuse, especially given the desperate need. But officials were suspicious about BGI and its connections to the Chinese government. They are the ultimate company that shows connectivity to both the communist state as well as the military apparatus. Bill Evanina recently stepped down as the top counterintelligence official in the U.S., a veteran of both the FBI and CIA. He was so concerned by BGI's COVID testing proposals and who would ultimately get the data that he authorized a rare public warning. Quote, foreign powers can collect, store, and exploit biometric information from COVID tests. We put out an advisory to not only every American, but to hospitals, associations, and clinics. Knowing that BGI is a, is a Chinese company, do we understand where that data is going? Tens of million Americans getting COVID tests this year. You don't think a lot of them are thinking, boy, where is this data going? What third party is involved in it? I would proffer no one's thinking that. But this shows the nefarious mindset of the Communist Party of China to take advantage of a worldwide crisis like COVID. Bill Evanina suspects these lab offers are modern-day Trojan horses. BGI comes to the U.S. bearing gifts, but harboring other motives. It's unclear whether BGI or any COVID tester would get DNA from nasal swabs, he says, but the labs are a way to establish a foothold to bring their equipment here, start mining your data, and set up shop in your neighborhood. You have to take a step back and ask yourself, who has access to that data? Supervisory Special Agent Edward Yu is a former biochemist turned FBI investigator. And with that, it, there's a very uncomfortable truth that comes out, that in the last decade or so, you'll see that China has heavily invested through the purchase or acquisition of actual companies, access to our data. Question is, where is this data going? All roads lead to China. They are the biggest player right now. The authoritarian government of China and its leader, Xi Jinping, have been boldly open about their ambitions to beat the West and reap the benefits of advances in DNA science and technology. The communist regime even has a published manifesto with a catchy name. They have something called Made in China 2025. And in these national strategies, they absolutely call out wanting to be the dominant leader in this biological age. So wanting to be the leader in being able to develop vaccines, uh, precision medicine. For all the classified briefings about China that Bill Evanina received, the threat really hit home when he called home. This is the argument I would have with my dad. It's 10 years from now, uh, my dad gets a phone call uh, and is told, hey, by the way, we understand you are going to develop hypertension right, and you're on the verge of Parkinson's. Here are three medicines you should take moving forward to help uh, alleviate some of the symptoms. My dad's been like, well, how do they know this? And the company's from China. Because they've already micro-targeted my dad based upon his DNA. And my dad says, okay, I'll do it. Devil's advocate argument would say, listen, if you're able to pinpoint something in my DNA, I'll sign up for that. That's exactly what my dad said. And so my argument is to him, from a long-term existential cost to our nation, do we want to do that? Do we want to have another nation systematically eliminate our healthcare services? Are we okay with that as a nation? If we are as a nation, then so be it. But that's what's happening. 
Our dependence on China during COVID for PPE, for masks, will pale in comparison to our potential healthcare dependence going forward, according to Edward Yu of the FBI. What happens if we realize that all of our future drugs, our future vaccines, future healthcare are all completely dependent upon a foreign source? If we don't wake up, we'll realize one day we've just become healthcare crack addicts and someone like China has become a pusher. Healthcare crack addicts, you say? Right. If they're in a position to be able to offer you personalized, effective, low-cost health care, would we be in a position to say, no, I don't think so? How close are we to that? I don't know how close we are, but I can feel it breathing down our neck. This, this sounds a little xenophobic. I mean, if China is the industry leader here, why wouldn't you do business with them? Well, at the end of the day, it's not about the Chinese people. It's about the Chinese government. He says China's government understands that their future success hinges on accumulating large amounts of human DNA. They are building out a huge domestic uh, database. And if they are now able to supplement that with data from all around the world, it's all about who gets the largest, most diverse data set. And so the ticking time bomb is that once they're able to achieve true artificial intelligence, then they're off to the races in what they can do with that data. You're saying biggest data set wins. Correct. Think of DNA as the ultimate treasure map, a kind of double helix chart containing the code for traits ranging from our eye color to our susceptibility to certain diseases. If you have 10,000 DNA samples, scientists could possibly isolate the genetic markers in the DNA associated with, say, breast cancer. But if you have 10 million samples, your statistical chances of finding the markers improve dramatically, which is why China wants to get so much of it. It is one-sided, though, that China passed a law last year. The Chinese government has absolutely clamped down on any access to their biological data or their biological sample. So it is a one-way street. So their data is not leaving China, but they're sucking it in from all over the world. Right. It's not just DNA, according to Bill Evanina. He and his colleagues have been tracking China as the country uses less than honorable methods to vacuum up all sorts of data from outside their borders. They do it both legitimately and illegitimately. They steal some data, but they're very strategic in how they acquire it throughout the world. You're saying at least in some cases, China's hacking to get this information. China is number one in the world at any kind of hacking capability, and they're brazen about it. In December, John Ratcliffe, then the director of national intelligence, went so far as to name China as the number one national security threat to America, citing specifically their theft of data and technology. We have uh, probably five or six healthcare companies the last five years who have been, I would say, penetrated, exfiltrated, hacked by China. What's the likelihood you and I have been hacked by China? 110%. Personal data? Personal data. Current estimates are that 80% of American adults have had all their personally identifiable information stolen by the Communist Party of China. The concern is that the Chinese regime is taking all that information about us, what we eat, how we live, when we exercise and sleep, and then combining it with our DNA data. With information about heredity and environment, suddenly they know more about us than we know about ourselves. And, bypassing doctors, China can target us with treatments and medicine we don't even know we need. Think about the dawn of um, the Internet of Things and the 5G networks and, the, and smart homes and smart cities. There are going to be sensors everywhere. It's going to be tracking your movement, your behavior, your habits. And ultimately, it's going to have a biological application, meaning that based on the data that gets collected, they'll be able to analyze that and look at improving your health. That data becomes incredibly relevant and very, very valuable. You're describing data almost as a, as a commodity. Data is absolutely going to be the new oil. All this may sound like a premise for a dystopian, futuristic science fiction movie. But U.S. government officials say the picture gets even scarier given how China is already using DNA strategically against its own citizens today. These are some of the most serious abuses that the Chinese government has committed in modern history. Sophie Richardson, director of the China Program for Human Rights Watch, says China has rounded up more than a million Uyghurs, Chinese citizens who are a Muslim minority, and jailed them in camps. 
The U.S. government calls this a crime against humanity. They're being subjected to political indoctrination. They can't use their own language. They're not allowed to worship. And those people are highly restricted in how they can live their lives. This is a population under constant surveillance. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a region that's awash in surveillance technology ranging from you know, facial recognition software, surveillance cameras, data doors, Wi-Fi sniffers. Part of the social control includes the forced collection of DNA. Under the guise of free physicals for Uyghurs, Richardson says China is actually collecting DNA and other biometric data that's then used specifically to identify people, target other family members, and refine facial recognition software. And those, national security officials say, are just the uses we know about. In response to the Uyghur repression, last July, the U.S. Department of Commerce sanctioned two subsidiaries of a Chinese biotech company. That company, BGI, the same one offering Washington State the COVID testing lab. Those companies were uh, identified to have been facilitating the collection of genetic information of ethnic Uyghurs. If anything, that should serve as a warning signal for all of us that that is potentially what can happen if our data gets out of our hands, how it could be used. It's not a coincidence BGI is involved in the Uyghur crisis, given the company's close relationship with the communist regime. In 2010, after receiving $1.5 billion from China's government, BGI was able to expand dramatically. They're monstrous. They have contracts with over 60 countries globally to provide not only genomic sequencing, but also to provide analytics. They say we're a private company, are they? There's no such thing as a private company in the Communist Party of China. Under a series of laws unthinkable in Western democracies, Chinese companies like BGI are obligated to share data with the Chinese regime. It's as if, say, Google, Amazon, and Facebook had to turn over their data to the CIA on demand. So you're trying to tell me the Chinese government, whether it's biotech or they can say, hey, we want your information, please provide it? Absolutely. You must provide any all data that's asked for by the Communist Party in China, which the scary part is sometimes it's not all their data. If you are in a joint partnership, a joint venture, their data is now susceptible to go to the Chinese Communist Party. As BGI touts on its own website, the company has been steadily developing partnerships with hospitals and biotech companies inside the United States, giving BGI, and by extension the Chinese government, potential access to our DNA data, sequencing technology, and analytics. How does BGI partner with U.S. companies? So they do it, first of all, with money. So investment. I want to invest $10 million, $20 million, $80 million in your company. Every company says, yes, come on in. At the same time, they're going to have an unwritten rule that they're going to be able to take that data, your sequencing capabilities. But what they don't know is China's keeping it, and they're giving you a copy back. BGI declined our request for an interview and said in a statement, quote, the notion that the genomic data of American citizens is in any way compromised through the activities of BGI in the U.S. is groundless. They said they are a private organization founded to benefit human health and well-being. Remember BGI's proposal to build COVID testing labs for the state of Washington? 60 Minutes learned that the company made similar proposals to more than five other states, including New York and California. And after federal officials warned against partnering with BGI, each state said no to BGI's labs. It's not just China that's recognized what a valuable commodity your DNA can be. As you'll hear when we come back, some of the fastest growing U.S. tech companies are in this space as well. In fact, you may have already surrendered your DNA by spitting in a tube. The financial stakes for dominating the global biotech sector, the industry that's bringing us the COVID vaccine, are staggering, estimated to be worth up to $4 trillion a year. For perspective, that's more than the valuation of Amazon and Apple combined. Not surprisingly, many U.S. companies want a piece of that pie and recognize that control over the future of healthcare lies in collecting and then analyzing massive quantities of data. So, like China, they too were building up vast libraries of health information. 
There are undeniable benefits to this, potential cures and treatments, some already in use. But there's also a darker truth buried in the fine print. Companies, including some of the ones that sell those popular genealogy test kits, could profit off of consumers and their private medical data. Sometimes Americans or people on the globe don't even know their value or their DNA, that, that it even has value. But it's your single sole identifier of everything about you as a human being. Bill Evanina just stepped down as the top counterintelligence official at the Directorate of National Intelligence. I'm a victim of identity theft. I can get a new visa or Amex. You get my genetic identity. I don't have a backup. That's correct. So it's your past and your future as well as your children's future. So in recent years, millions of Americans have given away their DNA for ancestry searches. Is that risky? It's very risky. And I think the unknown is probably the riskiest part. So risky, in fact, that the U.S. military recently issued a warning to all service members, instructing them not to use direct-to-consumer genealogy tests like those offered by Ancestry, 23andMe, and other companies. Quote, these genetic tests are largely unregulated and could expose personal and genetic information. Outside parties are exploiting the use of genetic data. From defense issued that proclamation saying, please do not use these genetic services because we are not comfortable yet as a government to understand where that genetic data goes. If it's bad for the military, we wondered why there are not government warnings to American consumers. Already, an estimated 50 million Americans have paid a small fee and sent in their saliva, hoping for clues to what country their ancestors came from, relatives they may not know they have, or some other information about their health. Genealogy firms are selling us on the use of DNA as a consumer product. But Supervisory Special Agent Edward Yu of the FBI says what they are really selling us is something else entirely. The return on investment is aggregating the data and what they can do with it once they have enough of it. You're saying these, these genealogy companies, the real value is everything you can do with this data set. The value is in the data. It, it's not just the genealogy companies. Everybody is looking at what kind of data do I have access to, how much do I have, and then how can I turn around and, and monetize it. That's where the money is. Absolutely. For example, just this past week, 23andMe was reported to be in talks to go public with a valuation of $4 billion. It's a common refrain in the world of biotech. Data is the new oil. And it's all types of health data that might come from your smartwatch, your social media, your credit card. UC Davis professor of law Lisa Ikemoto specializes in bioethics and is studying how the new market for DNA and health data is taking shape. It seems like a bit of a bait and switch. We pay 100 bucks, whatever it is, for our ancestry reports, and then they actually want to turn around and sell our genetic data. That's what's being hidden that you're allowing your personal information to be used by others, and that information's being transferred to third parties and it's being for uses that you never imagined. Professor Ikemoto is skeptical about whether true informed consent is being granted when we provide our DNA and points out that most customers click yes, giving permission for their data to be used for research. But Ikemoto wonders if they realize what that really means. We printed out the privacy forms for 23andMe and Ancestry. And this, I mean, this just a blizzard of, of paperwork and... Uh, and fine print. Does anyone read these things? We're so used to filling, sort of scrolling through these long documents online to upload the app or whatever it is, and then just clicking the I agree button at the end. This is an ancestry form. You grant royalty-free, worldwide, sub-licensable, transferable license to host, transfer, process, analyze, distribute, and communicate your genetic information. What does that mean in English? I think you're giving up all rights <laughs> um, and any potential commercial interest in the use of your DNA by Ancestry DNA. Who are they selling the data to? Who are the buyers here? Most of the um, genealogy companies are partnering with pharmaceutical companies, biotech startups, established research institutions. Ancestry declined our interview request and said Ancestry does not sell consumer DNA data and we do not have any for-profit research partnerships. Genealogy companies told us that the data they do share for research is made anonymous and that the research is a force of good. 
But with those third-party agreements to study disease and develop treatments can come investment dollars. 23andMe has a partnership with GlaxoSmithKline, $300 million to develop drugs based on this DNA. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? They might produce something very useful. In that sense, it's good. Um, it means that 23andMe and GlaxoSmithKline will make a huge amount of money. Um, the people who provided all the cells and tissues or DNA that's being used will make none. They'll probably be charged a lot of money <laughs> for the drugs if they ever need them. So we're providing the raw materials to create this product, and then we have to pay for the product. Yeah, that's exactly right. People are now being mined for their raw materials. It raises concerns about what it means to be human in this world. From the foundation of the company, we have always said, if our customers can't trust us, we don't have a business. CEO and founder of 23andMe, Ann Wojcicki, says her customers are making a conscious decision to contribute their DNA for the benefit of society. When we started the company, we sat down with the leading privacy experts, and what they taught me was that, Ann, privacy doesn't mean that your data is not shared anywhere. It means that we have choice. What percent of your customers are opting in and then saying, go ahead, use my DNA for your research? Over 80% of our customers opt in. But you're still choosing how and when and where their data is being used. We give people, so for instance, we have entered into a large collaboration with um, GlaxoSmithKline for therapeutic development. When we did that, we specifically emailed all of our customers and we gave them the opportunity to either opt into research or to opt out of research. But this idea that the value of this company is in the data, this is where the real growth potential is. Your chief scientist said it's genius. People were paying us to build databases. What we have done is we have empowered individuals with this opportunity to come together to crowdsource research. And I absolutely stand behind, we are going to develop drugs so that everyone is actually benefiting from the human genome. So absolutely, the data is valuable. I want to keep pushing you on this point. You're relying on the kindness of strangers. You're, you're not paying them. They don't have a stake in potential profits. Is that a fair exchange? I believe our customers feel that the, the, the number one thing that we can do that is going to benefit them is the end result, which is the end result is actually develop a drug. That's a long way from learning more about your family's country of origin. And though they are using our DNA, what's essentially our barcode, for drug development, genealogy firms like 23andMe are not subject to HIPAA regulations. But Wojcicki asserts her company's privacy policies are stronger than HIPAA anyway. Other federal laws about the security of our data, they're patchwork and incomplete, according to Lisa Ikemoto. This message of trust us, what's your response to that? Given 30 years of research, I'm not willing to give my trust to the biotech industry. I think it's probably true that the researchers who do this work have the best intentions in most cases, but that doesn't mean that I can't be exploited in the process. And then there's the issue of security. Multiple consumer genealogy firms have been targeted by hackers in the past few years, putting our DNA data at risk. Both Ancestry and 23andMe told us they have not been breached. Do you agree the possibility of a hack is a serious, serious concern? Anyone who tells you that a hack is not possible is lying. And so I have to make sure I'm doing everything that is reasonably possible on data security and that I'm doing everything I can with transparency to make sure you trust us and that you are never surprised. But you may be surprised about another potential security risk. How much money foreign firms, particularly Chinese, are investing into U.S. companies that collect our biodata, according to former intelligence official Bill Evanina. So the amount of effort that the Chinese government has put into investing in companies in the U.S., current estimates are 23 Chinese-based or affiliated companies are operating inside the U.S. in consultation, collaboration, partnership, investment with U.S.-based companies. China's reach has gotten so vast, it's drawn the attention of a little-known but increasingly busy branch of the Treasury Department, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS. Among its duties, sniffing out suspicious business deals. 
Just a few months ago, a Chinese firm was set to buy a San Diego fertility clinic, in part because the fertility clinic is located near six U.S. military bases. CFIUS blocked the sale before it could take place. What if that fertility clinic sells all their capabilities and data to a company in China? All that data is gone. So all that capability of your unborn fetus are now owned and operated by the Chinese company. In other words, the company could have had access to the DNA not just of U.S. soldiers, but of their unborn babies. Evanina also expressed his concern to us that 23andMe has some Chinese investors. We know there's an investment in a Chinese company in 23andMe. We, what we don't know is there is a data sharing agreement with that company or not. We asked 23andMe CEO Ann Wojcicki. She told us that the Chinese investors have no access to the genetic information of the company's customers. But she does agree with Bill Evanina on one critical point. The Chinese threat to U.S. biotech is real, and it's no exaggeration to say our future might depend on how we address it. What I've been most worried about, frankly, is that China is very publicly stating that they want to win in the genetic information revolution. We need to be super vigilant about China, you know, with any kind of data. But the issue is more that China's putting billions of dollars into their own genetic programs, and we are not. Why aren't we investing like this? It's leadership. I need leadership at the top to say we need to have these types of large programs. I absolutely share the concern that the United States is underfunding genetic research. And I think that if we want to win the biotech genome revolution, we need to start funding it. On April 25th of this year, authorities in Sacramento, California, announced a great fanfare that they had solved a notorious 40-year-old cold case and arrested a man they say is the Golden State Killer, a clever, sadistic, serial murderer and rapist who terrified the state back in the 1970s and 80s. But more significant than the arrest was the way it came about, using a powerful new tool called genetic genealogy, which law enforcement says has since been used to crack cold cases all over the country. It's a mixture of high-tech DNA analysis, high-speed computer technology, and old-fashioned family genealogy pioneered by some quirky collaborators who got into it as a hobby. In just six months, it has opened up a new frontier in criminology and also raised questions about privacy and the ethics of using DNA. We found the needle in the haystack, and it was right here in Sacramento. The search for the Golden State Killer had frustrated law enforcement for decades. Thirteen grisly murders and as many as 50 rapes, sometimes followed up with terrifying phone calls to surviving victims. The police never had a good lead until this year. It wasn't a new witness or a snitch, but something that they had had for years, the killer's DNA. They knew everything about his genetic makeup, but not his identity. No matches in law enforcement computers. Then, just before his retirement, cold case investigator Paul Holes pursued a final gambit. Using an alias, he submitted the killer's DNA to an obscure public database called GEDmatch, popular with genealogy enthusiasts and good at finding family members. If we can't find him, can we find somebody related to him and then work our way back to him? And so ultimately, that's what we did. And it worked. After months of research and investigation, the twisted strands of family DNA led them to the doorstep of one of their own, a retired police officer. My detectives arrested James Joseph D'Angelo, 72 years old, living in Citrus Heights. Authorities had surreptitiously obtained a fresh DNA sample from D'Angelo, and according to the arrest warrant, it was an identical match to that of the Golden State Killer. Since that very first case in April, Local law enforcement agencies around the country have used the technique to make arrests in at least 11 other cold cases. All of them would still be cold if it weren't for Curtis Rogers, a retired octogenarian in Lake Worth, Florida, who runs the largest public DNA database in the U.S. out of this three-room bungalow. This is our 
headquarters for Jedmatch. Uh, this is it? This is it. It was built 1925. How many employees do you have? None. Rogers, a retired Quaker Oats executive and genealogy buff, started Jedmatch eight years ago as a hobby, along with his partner, John Olson, an accomplished computer engineer in Texas. And these are all first cousins. They wanted to provide a free open source website where people could upload their DNA file and search for relatives and ancestors. Did you know the police were using this to solve crimes? Not at all. There was an email from one of our users that said Jed Match was involved in finding the Golden State Killer. That was the first I knew of it. My world turned upside down at that point. In what way? By the time I got to work, there were satellite trucks up and down this little narrow street that we're on. You see that yellow house over there with the blue shutters? There were reporters knocking on the door. I mean, I, it was, you know, what do I do? You were upset. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. About what? About whether we were invading our user, users' privacy in some way that they had no expectation of it being invaded. Jedmatch's policy statement, which had already cautioned that the public site might be used for purposes other than genealogy, notified its community that people could withdraw their file if they didn't want their DNA used by police to solve crimes. So the blue indicates that there's a match there. While its office in Florida is Spartan, its computer servers in an Oregon data center are not. They can compare 600,000 separate locations in one person's DNA to those of its one million users and determine family matches in just four to five hours, listing as many as 2,000 distant relatives with the closest ones at the top of the page, along with their contact information. And then you have the, the email address of the people that it belongs to. Correct. So if you want to call them or if you want to email them, you can just... You can email them. Genealogy is a, is a contact sport. You want to contact people. Roger says Jedmatch is not in the business of finding criminals or solving crimes. He says it can be used by law enforcement to develop initial leads, but it's just the first step in a long process that requires special skills to turn hundreds of possibilities into a handful of suspects. Law enforcement can't do this. It takes an expert genealogist. That's Cece. She is the best of the best. He's talking about C.C. Moore. Genealogy is a small world. She has spent most of the past decade working alone out of her home near San Diego, helping people identify their birth parents and putting names on the unknown dead, a precursor to her latest calling. When I would be asked, what do I do? I'd say, well, I'm a professional genetic genealogist. And people just look at me blankly like, what is that? People are just beginning to find out. C.C. Moore is now the lead genealogist for Parabon Nano Labs, a small DNA technology company in Reston, Virginia, that is leading the way in genetic genealogy. The sheriff's office arrested Michael F. A. Henslick without incident. Or... The day we visited her, police halfway across the country announced that they had made an arrest on a nine-year-old murder case that she'd been working on. This was just this morning, a couple hours ago. Whereabouts? In Champaign, Illinois. This is the Holly Cassano murder. She had been stabbed repeatedly, I think about 60 times in her mobile home. And she was a young single mother. Moore has played a pivotal role in identifying suspects in 13 of the 14 cases that have arisen since the Golden State Killer opened the floodgates six months ago. I'm looking at the people that share the most DNA with this unknown subject. She does it by taking the partial family matches that are generated by Jedmatch and builds out family trees that she hopes will point to the unknown suspect. So our unknown subject is here. Okay, so he's sharing DNA with this person and this person. But two different family trees. Yeah. This is how she identified the alleged killer in a high-profile 31-year-old double homicide. And I'm trying to find an intersection where these two family trees come together so we're getting that right mix of DNA. So I'm building these down. I'm saying who are their children, who are their children, their children, their children, who are their children, theirs, theirs, and theirs. She uses things like marriage licenses, birth announcements, obituaries, even Facebook to trace the ancestors. I found an obituary. And that obituary had a descendant from this tree carrying a surname that I recognized from this tree. And I was able to find their marriage record. So a descendant from this couple and a descendant from this couple 
married and had only one son. That's fascinating. That one son was William Earl Talbot II, the only male carrier of the DNA mix from the two families that could match the DNA found at the gruesome homicide scenes of Jay Cook and Tanya Van Kylenborg. The young Canadian couple was brutally murdered in 1987 in Washington State. CC's report went to Detective Jim Scharf, who had worked the cold case for 13 years. This was the tip of a lifetime to solve this case. He said Talbot was never even on their radar, but at the time of the murders, he was 24 years old and living not far from where the bodies were discovered. Police tailed Talbot, collected his DNA from a discarded cup, and turned it over to a crime lab technician for analysis. And she told me that we had a match to the suspect that killed Tanya and Jay. And it brought tears to my eyes. And then I screamed, yeah, <laughs> you know, we got him. When I give these names to law enforcement, I am really sure because all those pieces have to come together a really specific way. And then for them to end up right in the town where these crimes happened, it can't be a coincidence. Do you remember the day when you figured yes. out who it was? Yes, I remember. I remember the moment when I finally get to all of these people. It's because it's a pretty profound moment to zero in on that. It's certainly a heavy discovery. Why? Well, if I'm right, which I believe I am, I know a secret that only the killer knows or only the rapist knows. It's, you know, it's, it's a profound thing. This has changed lives. And, I, you know, I see what I believe is the answer. One of the hardest answers to come up with was who killed eight-year-old April Tinsley, who was abducted while playing outside her home in 1988. Her body was discovered three days later in a ditch outside Fort Wayne, Indiana. She'd been raped and murdered. The police had the DNA of her killer, but could never find a match. For 30 years, he taunted investigators, scrawling threats on a barn door and tying notes to girls' bicycle seats. The amount of interviews, man hours that went into this case is unbelievable. Brian Martin has been a Fort Wayne homicide detective for six years. He was the one who got the call in July from C.C. Moore saying there had been a breakthrough. We began looking at the individuals that she had given us, and within four to five hours, we began surveillance. Fourteen days later, that individual was taken into custody and is currently in the Allen County Jail. The suspect is John Miller, a 59-year-old loner who worked at Walmart and lived in this trailer six miles away from where April's body was found. He's pled not guilty, but according to this affidavit, when police went to arrest him, they asked Miller if he had any idea why they wanted to talk to him. Miller looked at them and said, April Tinsley. He knew exactly what it was for. Is that the most satisfying part of the job? There's two things that are satisfying. Finally having the pieces come together is very satisfying. And then giving these families some justice to have an arrest, that is the most meaningful thing to me. The support for genetic genealogy in the law enforcement community is virtually unanimous. Parabon Nano Labs, the company C.C. Moore works for, had been anticipating it for years. It's already marketing technology to police agencies that creates computer-generated composites of suspects, predicting eye color, skin tone, and perhaps even facial structure based on their DNA. Steve Armentrout is Parabon CEO. So you were ready when the Golden State case happened? Yeah, the wheels were already in motion. We sat back and watched the public response. It was overwhelmingly positive. This was like a starting gun to go ahead and move out. Armentrout says Parabon already has more than 100 cases in the pipeline but there is no shortage of cautionary questions being raised by civil rights groups and bioethicists about the reliability of crime scene DNA, the lack of standards and protocol in this revolutionary new field, and whether website users have become genetic informants on their relatives. The field is so new it's almost impossible to predict consequences. None of the cases have gone to trial, 
and no one has pled guilty. Right. Do you anticipate that there will be legal objections? Sure. I would think any good defense attorney is going to challenge this just because there has never been a precedent-setting decision on specifically using genetic genealogy and GEDmatch. So I look forward to the day that we get that decision. Sixty minutes overtime. I absolutely think that being able to understand the human genome is going to be critical for the future. Our story for 60 Minutes this week is about DNA and biodata. It has become a commodity that people around the world see value in. Ann Wojcicki is the CEO and founder of 23andMe. We allow people direct access to their genetic information. You spit in a tube, you send it back in, and then we open up this door. It's almost like looking in a mirror for the first time. It gives you all this information about your ancestry and your health. We talked to government officials who were concerned about this and that people, they send in a hundred bucks and it's, it's kind of fun and you learn whether you're Portuguese or Spanish or Swedish or Norwegian and you don't really think about the implications. We had multiple people describe this to us as, as almost a bait and switch, that the customers come and they're going to learn about their genetics and they're going to learn about their ancestry. And meanwhile, you are building this valuable, vast biodata library. How do you respond to that? It's about choice and transparency. Our customers absolutely have the ability to not participate in research. We don't default people into anything. I never want one of my customers to feel duped, ever. What happens when somebody opts in and then they change their mind? People have the opportunity and choice to say they no longer want to participate. And your data can be deleted. You're saying these, these genealogy companies, the real value is everything you can do with this data set. The value is in the data. It, it's not just the genealogy companies. Everybody is looking at what kind of data do I have access to, how much do I have, and then how can I turn around and, and monetize it. That's where the money is. Absolutely. We spoke with Edward Yu, a supervisory special agent at the FBI. I'm thinking that in recent years, millions of people have voluntarily given their genetic data for these ancestry searches. To what extent does that concern you? The challenge, again, is about awareness. And many companies, um, institutions, are doing their due diligence and looking at privacy. And that becomes a, a challenge in how do we educate the public how do we raise a consumer or a patient's level of awareness of the true value of the data and giving them the tools to understand where is their data potentially going to be going, how is it going to be utilized, but more importantly, who's going to have access to it? Big data matters, and it applies to healthcare as well. And if you have 10,000 samples and you're looking for a marker for a susceptibility to cancer, you might find it. If you have 10 million samples, you're going to have a lot better odds. I should emphasize, that our customers come to us. We never default people. This is an opt-in. And what we have found is they want to be empowered. They want this information about themselves. They want to know how to prevent. And if there's a disease out there, they want to be part of the solution. What do you say to the customer that says, you're telling me how valuable my DNA is. What am I getting out of this? I'm not getting paid for it. I'm not getting a, a stake in the upside. What's in it for me? If you talk to anyone who is sick, especially anyone with a terminal illness, and you ask them what they want, what they're looking for is a treatment or something that's going to benefit their children. And we learned the most important thing that 23andMe could do would be to put our own money into developing ways our customers are going to benefit from the human genome. But I should emphasize, we are reinvesting all of our money into therapeutics development. Big data is not unique to healthcare, but it certainly is playing a huge role now that's only going to get bigger. And not only you have that ability to protect your DNA, you have that fiduciary responsibility to protect it for your children, your grandchildren, because one person's DNA, you get the entire family. Bill Evanina is the former director of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center. Is there no law on the books that forbids companies from selling your data like it's a commodity? That's correct. In the U.S., your HIPAA law, allows you to have protection based upon what's called covered providers, your healthcare company or your healthcare provider, but not third-party aggregators or collectors of data like genetics. If I want to provide my customers 
with the best data security, there's all kinds of standards that are out there that do not involve HIPAA. Sounds like your standards are stricter than HIPAA. We have an incredibly sophisticated, nimble team that thinks all day long about data security, privacy, how do we make sure that we are doing everything reasonably possible to protect our customers' data. We've heard again and again this refrain, data is the new oil. What does that mean to you? The United States needs to be more aggressive with how they are thinking about genetics and how we're thinking about this data revolution. And if we want to be able to have that lead, we need to invest in it.